I'm going to speak very briefly about the during process because it's a challenging task and there's always a lot to consider. Um, but it's also a wondrous privilege just to be able to look at so much great work and to think about that work really deeply. And as an artist juror, it's an especially interesting process to try and shelve one's biases and personal preferences and really look at every aspect of what each applicant um, submits to a, a program like this. Because as a jury, we were looking at we had specific criteria that we were considering, but we were also looking for that something else and that something other. And it wasn't just an artistic ambition. It wasn't just a clarity of how the artist wrote about their work. It's not just technical skill. It's not just ideas that are embedded in the work. It's, it's not just experimentation. It's all of that and, and more. And Christine and Whitney's applications exemplified all of those aspects and other factors too. So, you know, they offered work that got us, the jury, really excited. And it was, it was like being able to, even though we were doing it mostly remotely, it was like we could touch it and feel it and engage with it. Um, and so I also would like to thank um, my fellow jury partners, Monique Deshane at the Director at Equinom Gallery and Arthur Ove, because um, it was a wondrous experience um, being involved in that process with them. And to all of the other folks who received um, support by way of uh, this program, Adama, Martina Arash and Robin. So with that, I'd like to start a conversation with Christine and Whitney. Welcome, thank you, congratulations. And by asking each of you, what inspired you or prompted you to apply for this particular fellowship? Christine, do you want to go first since I'm going first in the sure. lecture? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I think it started when I was looking for places to print eight by 10 negatives. And then I discovered the workspace residency and thought that would be amazing to work in the dark rooms there. And uh, what I noticed that really struck me about Penumbra is that there's an equal emphasis on concept and materiality and it seemed like a really special place in that regard of balancing that together and um, was also really excited by the work of the past residents and so to know that these jurors selected my work and Whitney's work feels like a great honor especially because of the work that these jurors have done in terms of curation and and artwork themselves and criticism so that feels like a really great honor and thank you so much. I'm going to piggyback off what Christine was saying and it is, it is a really great honor, especially considering who the jurors were and the history of the workspace residency. Um, I, I had applied this, I think this was my third time applying. And um, I had spoken at Penumbra last year as well. And um, I just had such a great experience speaking there. And it felt like someplace I wanted to be and be in the community and the legacy of the foundation as well. And I was, I'm working on making a book and I wanted to use that time and space to sort of use the facilities and have the support necessary at Penumbra and in the community of New York City um, in terms of making the book. So yeah, it, again, I'm really, I'm really grateful and thank you. Terrific, thank you. So with that, so that we've got time for audience questions and time for individual questions with each of you, let's start with Whitney. And Whitney's gonna talk about her work and what work she applied with, what new work Whitney has started since the grant was awarded. So you will get to see some work in progress, which is always a lovely, opportunity too, um, both for those who are watching and listening, but also for the artist. Um, I think I find that when, when I'm speaking about work in progress, it's, it allows me to solidify ideas or to talk about ideas that might be in the work that I haven't thought about or vice versa. Um, so Whitney, over to you for the next okay. 10 minutes to tell us what you would like to share. Just bear with me as I screen share. 
Odette, I see you, and you can see this as a as just a regular screen, right? It's perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Here we go. So, um, what I want to do is kind of give you a quick background. I grew up in LA, and um, I was in high school in the '90s, and I saw these three individual shows. I saw a Robert Frank show, a Cindy <laughs> show, and a Robert Maplethorpe show, all within a, like a two year time frame. And I think these three shows really shaped how I approach picture making. And that's sort of in terms of this like performative element, photograph everything in this sort of way of framing my life in very specific, narr very specific narratives. Um, and I'm just gonna speak really briefly about where, about where I'm coming up from. Um, I have, so this, as you can see, it was 2003 to 2005 in my undergrad. I was taking self portraits and photographing my friends. And what I think, what really interests me, especially in terms of the self portraits that I'm like the first and the third is I became interested in a personal narrative in terms of self rep, self rep representation and using the tool of drama to heighten certain experiences I wanted to perform in front of the camera with. Um, I've, always used for, I've always used picture making as a way to reflect back onto me. And it's always been about my vision, yet it's also been about my experiences and the visual world that has shaped my vision. I'm just, this is like a brief introduction to sort of what I do. 2007, I got very interested in black and white photography, returning to LA to go to grad school. And what I'm going to show are three pictures, including this one from a series, the song itself is already a skip. And um, what, and looking back, it basically, the way I shoot is never so much, I, I know what I'm doing while I'm making the pictures. It's more like I make, I make the pictures, I sit on them for a while, like, you know, I don't, I don't show them, I don't, I just sort of like store them in a separate place and I'll go and look at them and start having a seeing how the conversation occurs and what i'm just going to show three pictures from this series what started to happen with these three I'll, call, I'll kind of go back is i started realizing it was about what was hidden as much as revealed in terms of the in terms of taking the picture and in terms of the photographic print as well excuse me um doing good on time okay and so I, and also this sort of this term, this like term of drama I was interested in, which continued on from the, from the color self, from the color self portraits. And then in 2014 for, for a couple of years, I wanted to try something really different again. I wanted to go back to color photography. I wanted to go back to shooting film and color. And um, I was interested in form with the black and white pictures but I was more interested in this sort of gestural form of the female body. And basically, I've been looking at the female body ever since I started looking, you know, like I was looking, like looking at magazines, TV, films, billboards. I grew up in LA, so billboards were all around me and seeing how the female form was depicted. And I kind of wanted to respond to that. And also in terms of photography's historical narrative, like Weston and Imogene Cunningham and the sort of modernist photographers and how they shaped the female form in terms of their practice. But then I also wanted to include myself in this project. And that was because I wanted to place myself in with these other female friends that I was photographing and that were posing for me. And in terms of talking about the gaze, I wanted the gaze to be reflected back onto me as much as them. Okay. And so then I also made a, I made, I made my first book with Hess, with Hess Press with this project. And at first it was just about these singular images that existed in this body of work, but I wanted the book to kind of act as like sort of questioning the idea of what, of what, of what is a good photograph, like how images can be repeated and gestures can be repeated and thinking about the gestural forms distance between the subject 
and the photographer, i.e. me, and how I can get close and further away. I wanted to explore that sort of montage. Okay, and so then this is the work that I applied with. And in 2019, I had left Los Angeles and moved to teach at, um, in Western New York at Alfred University. I turned 40. Like there was a lot of transitions in my life and I didn't know what to photograph, but I knew I was going through, like I don't wanna say changes, but I knew I was like leaving my young adult self and entering into like a new stage of life. And I felt sort of like I had nothing, I had no choice but to photograph myself. And so what I wanna show is, um, images from a show I did at my gallery in New York called Sit, called Situations Gallery. And as you can see here, there's three black and white pictures and there's also a mirror and um, with a bunch of contact sheets on them. And so, and I'll get into the self portraits in a second, but the show was called Animal Whole Selfie. Basically, I took these ideas of what I had been photographing, animals, holes and self and self portraits over an extended period of time those were the three things I was interested in, in terms of how I was wandering around and taking pictures. And I used this umbrella metaphor of animal holes and selfies to shape the show and turn inwards. And I'll just show the horses, the, the, three, black, the three black and whites before I keep talking. And so then after you sort of enter into this umbrella and you go underneath the umbrella, you'll see um, on the opposite wall uh, about 50 self portraits I took where I'm basically thinking about ideas of aging, isolation, really long winters, humiliation, humor, um, sexuality, and sort of performing all of these things with my body and performing these ideas. Um, I made these choices to shoot the black and white pictures with a 6-7 camera, a um, Mamiya 7. And then I went in and photographed myself with the, four, with, the lar with the large format camera on color film. Basically like choosing to structure and stage, and stage, my, and stage my body as I would like an art installation or a sculpture I was making. And then I made these four by five contact sheets at Lux Lab in New York City um, in their color lab. And I, and I taped them to the, I, and I taped them to the mirror. And that was, it was, it was a very condensed, intense show. And this is and so now what so now what I'm working on is what I'm using with the pen, Penumbra workspace grant is I'm scanning all of these and I'm going to make and I'm working with self published be be happy editions and I'm going to make a book with them. Um, and so that's kind of where and that's kind of where I'm at now, but I also want to show you what it. it and it's actually only one picture I wanted to share because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like very private and I've been spending my time scanning in images and fixing those and doing the sort of match prints. But I wanted to just, it's very different from what I've ever photographed in some ways, but the pathos is there. Sort of like, this is how I feel now. And so I think what I want to wrap up saying is that I come, I come to picture making from this emotional place. I want to express my emotions, but I use certain ways to, perf I use objects or bodies, certain ways to perform these feelings and ideas that I'm thinking about. And um, I'm right under 10 minutes and I'll stop screen sharing, right? Or no, by all means, oh. leave it there. Okay, Thank you. Okay. No, that's fantastic. Okay. Thank okay. you so okay. much, Whitney. That was tremendous. Um, I had a couple of questions for you. Yeah. I, I loved how you described it as a, a, or the phrase was a tool of drama. Yeah. And 
then relating that to performance. And then you went on to talk about that process of marination is what I wrote down where you're making work and then you put it away or put it aside. How do you know when it's time to lift the lid? I think that's such a great question. And I feel like that's something I feel like it's very, like it's very intuitive. Like if I have a deadline, then I give myself enough time or I just know it's time to sort of lift the lid on it. But like I, at, as, as I said, as I wrapped up, like I, it's like this emotional thing, picture making and performing ideas, but I'm also a very intuitive photographer, even though I'm using a large format camera. I always taught photography in undergrad by professors that really encouraged me to just like go out and shoot, you know, like just follow follow it, follow your vision and just shoot, 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 shoot and shoot all this film. So I would say it's very intuitive. Yeah. And that's, and that's how, and that's how my practice functions. Great. In terms of the, that, when you were describing that process of looking, mm -hmm. I, I thought about a kind of maturity or an expansion of the way we look not necessarily the older we get, but the more we look at and the more we look through things. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could talk about how that had changed and expanded over time from looking at billboards versus noticing something else that just how that, that, that growth occurs and the kinds of things that you become more or less interested in the more or less that you look at them. And I'm thinking too of your own body when you're photographing yourself over and again, that you get to know yourself in a way in front of the camera that is very different to being separate from the device. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm clear, you're asking me like the transitions from looking out to looking in to performing the body. Transitions is, that, is a great word. I love that. Yes. Um, I think, I think first I'm learning. I finally learned that I, do projects, like in terms of my picture making. I always thought it sort of all blended together. And then now I like the structure of projects and looking back, I, I didn't know that, but now, but now I know that and I really appreciate that way of working. So I think it's more like I'm responding to things I'm thinking about and what I'm looking at. And then basically I'll make a project about it now, was I looking at my body and making all those pictures? No, but I was thinking about all these things going on inside of me that my own personal narrative and my own thoughts and ideas about my own life that I wanted to then perform because I could, I didn't know how to photograph like ideas of, about the abject without photographing myself mm -hmm. because like, cause, cause I felt it all inside of me you know, like aging and getting sick and these winters and, and sort of, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I'll just, end, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, I, I also really liked when you said you, you just felt you had no choice but to photograph yourself. That was it. That was the option. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question to that is also, how did that come to being no choice? That, that, that was it. It was, it was very, it was like, I was photographing a lot. Like I'm always taking pictures and the work that felt like the stakes were raised the highest were the self portraits before I started really making them like proceeding on and saying like, okay, I'm going to focus on this. And I felt really uncomfortable and I felt nervous. And I thought that was a good place to be, to move forward with a project. That's a great answer. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So okay, Christine, you. we would love to hear from you for the next 10 minutes about everything that you applied, well, what you applied with and, and what you've been working on since. Okay. Let's find my screen here. Okay, 
there it is. So for this, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that I applied to Penumbra with and then my newer work that I've been working on since. So uh, going back about five, ten years, here's um, this, this photograph of this frozen waterfall. And the thing that I like to imagine is that the water actually froze when I took the picture. And so I wanted to capture some kind of moving thing. I wanted to still it and it evaded me. This water, it ended up freezing because I was trying to still it. And so I like thinking about how something changes just by looking at it or something refuses to be captured by a camera. Um, the slogans promise that photography can freeze time and preserve memory, but I like to think that photographs are something that give us a really keen sense of the passage of time. So um, another landscape photograph from this series, even Amaranth, was taken in the woods. And I'm thinking about the vernacular language surrounding photography. We always tend to say, we shoot this, we shoot that. And I think of shooting landscapes as being like hunting in the woods. Um, when I was an MFA student in California, I remember my teacher told me, she said, you know, you really shouldn't go walking in the hills by yourself. And I was showing her my pictures. And so I think about the risk taking involved in a picture like this. It's large format film and any large format film is kind of like high stakes gambling in some way. It's like the thrill of, oh, you know, like there's this one shot and I got to get it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and it usually surprises me the result. And um, then there's also the risk of being in this place at this time where the, the earth is still uh, has fires underneath of the ground that I could fall into. This is after a California wildfire and um, being out in the landscape in the dusk with the with my head underneath of a dark cloth. There's like a sense of vulnerability there. So these photographs are part of my project called Even Amaranth. And this is inspired by the myth of Diana and Actaeon, an ancient Roman myth. And uh, the story goes that Diana, the goddess of the hunt and fertility, was bathing. And Actaeon, a proud hunter, came upon her. And everyone knew that no one was supposed to see her naked ever. But he couldn't help him. He, he stumbled upon her. And he couldn't help it. And he stood there and he watched her. And she caught him she got angry and she turned him into a stag he ran off and was chased and devoured by his own hounds so I think it's an interesting parallel to the subtle violence of photography and the subtle voyeurism inherent in taking pictures and the idea of trying to capture nature through landscape photography. Um, this landscape is camera shy. It refuses to be ever fully possessed the same way that Diana refuses to be visually possessed. Uh, for this body of work, I used the uh, plant amaranth. I grew it from seed and made dye out of it. And here you have a photogram of the plant amaranth colored out of itself. I used this dye to make anthotype pictures or uh, they're, they're just basically faded pictures of dye. I coat paper with dye of the amaranth. Here's making the dye, coating the paper with the dye. And then I expose a transparency sandwiched in glass on top of that dyed paper and the sun just uh, bleaches away and fades the highlights and then the ink on the transparency protects the shadows and forms the image. Uh, from the moment that I take apart this sandwich, the image is formed by its own decay but then it's impossible to stop it from fading. It's impossible to fix it. So you could put it in a hermetically sealed, anoxic, dark chamber and never look at it and it might last forever. Or you could put it in a bright sunny room and um, it might last a month or you know, depending upon what the pigment was and depending upon where you put it, it could really range in time. So um, let's see, go back here. 
Here's the installation view of the anthotypes are the, the red, orangey, yellow colored photographs. And then you have the silver gelatin prints and you have inkjet prints. And um, I like to think about how here you have Acteon being attacked by his hounds as this massive faded picture. Um, they're all contact prints, these anthotypes. So it was um, an interesting challenge to make such a large contact print. And I like how you can walk up to him and he's life size, yet the more you are in the presence and, and looking at him, the faster he disappears. And he is made out of something that I forgot to mention, amaranth. It also has this other little uh, puzzle piece connection. It literally means unfading in Greek, and it happens to be associated with the goddess Diana, the goddess of the hunt and fertility that this story is all about. So um, it relates to the, 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 the subject and the medium, and Diana, she's like, represented through the medium of the amaranth plant. So she's there as the medium, but she's never represented through the imagery. She's only evoked through the use of her plant. And then we get to see Acteon, but the more we see him, the more he disappears. This all reminds me of this quote by uh, Susan Sontag in her On Photography from the 70s. She wrote, between photographer and subject, there has to be distance. The camera doesn't rape or even possess, though it may presume, intrude, trespass, distort, exploit, and at the farthest reach of metaphor, assassinate. All activities that, unlike the sexual puss and shove, can be conducted from a distance and with some detachment. So here's the next body of work that I included in my um, Penumbra application. It's called Objects, Apparitions, and um, another anthotype made from elderberry in this case. And the, the favorite question that people tend to ask about this work is, well, how long will these last? Um, you know, how long are we talking about here? And, and I think it's interesting because it's like asking, well, what is my life expectancy? How long will my, well, anything survive? And that always depends upon so many different factors that it's impossible to like totally calculate. Um, I, I think it's interesting how they're constantly changing very gradually and you can only, it's like you, you look at it and it's like looking at yourself in the mirror and all of a sudden it occurs to you that, oh, this looks older now, this looks different and I didn't even realize it. It's like seeing the wrinkle in the mirror. We don't see the wrinkle appear in front of us, but it gradually happens and then we recognize it. So I like to imagine someone living with these pictures long enough that they become invisible and I imagine someone coming in as a visitor to someone's house and they look at this picture hanging on the wall that's a frame with this um, kind of color field abstract pale tone inside the frame and they say you know I, I just I just don't get it like why do you have this empty picture on your wall and then the person who lives there can tell them oh well this is what this picture used to be like. This is the story of this picture. This is what I remember of the picture. And this is what it was like to live with the picture. And so therefore I like to think that it retains its value even though it's invisible. So um, coming to present day, here in the time of increased isolation, I've been really pushed to make my own workspace. And so here's my garage darkroom that I made this summer. I set up my four by five and larger and, and everything. So that, that feels really good. My cat smudge can come visit me while I'm working and then you have the anthotypes they expose by themselves very isolated in a backfield behind my house and no one can see them and they can't see anyone else they're also very isolated i like to wonder what happens while this process of the exposure of like a week's length of time is happening while they're being made 
So the new body of work that I've been making is about the breakdown of photographic representation. And I've been photographing rocks and statue fragments with large format film. All the textural detail of the film gives me the impression that I could reach out and touch the thing in the picture, that maybe I have actually captured the subject. It's like the idea that you could reach out and hold on to something really concrete and stable like a rock. And yet the more stable and solid that the picture is, the more I realize that the subject isn't actually there. Uh, so here you have my past work was recognizable statues. You look at it, you're like, oh, statue. These, it's not just that the medium of the print is breaking down by its decay, but it's also that the subject matter is breaking down and becoming less recognizable. So the statues become like, rocks that you could look at and, and think about what it used to be a bigger part of. I use lichen dye for this project and lichen has a correlation to the subject matter of the rocks. It grows on rocks and it also grows very slowly just like the anthotypes expose very slowly and, and change very slowly. Um, I've been questioning what it means to make work about with these sort of images and pictures or this subject matter when the power dynamics of monuments is being exposed and challenged. Um, in an essay this, this month in the New Yorker, there was about American monuments. They were described as having the aura of permanence and also containing a desire to stop time, to hold on to power. And I think that's interesting because you could say the same thing about monuments and about photographs. They both show the desire to stop time and they both show the desire to hold on to power. So here you have this, this kind of mix of the power dynamic of both enacting this desire for control, but also the letting go as, as it fades. So I got access to Cornell's plaster cast collection for this project and it's an off campus warehouse. It's kind of like what you do with the things that you don't, you don't know what to do. So you put them in your basement, your attic. That's what Cornell has done with these things. They put them out in this warehouse. And so here you have Julius Caesar in bubble wrap and uh, been turning them into anthotypes and silver gelatin prints making mirror diptychs where one is a archival permanent silver gelatin print and the other one mirrored is the anthotype and I like how you can't have one without the other. How am I doing on time? You're doing great. You probably oh, okay. have another minute or two. Okay, great. Perfect. So this picture was less conceptual, more intuitive and spontaneous. And I, it kind of reminds me of that frozen waterfall picture that I took. I like thinking that when I took the picture, the rocks crystallized and that the rock is somehow glowing with illumination of the moment of being photographed. And um, then this picture is about showing what it feels like for me to look at a gorgeous silver gelatin print or any sort of photograph that has great amount of resolution and detail. So whenever that happens, I get up close and I wanna get closer and closer and closer. And I imagine that I could actually reach out and touch the subject. And so here, this is, a, this is enacting what it feels like to look at the picture. And then this is a brand new anthotype and I'm calling it reproduction. In the past, all of the hands in my pictures were my mother's hands, but these are my hands holding a cast, a plaster cast of my hand from about 15 years ago. And the phrase grasping at, at straws, grasping at straws seems uh, relevant here. Uh, this picture is about futile attempts to hold things. A picture is a reproduction, uh, a direct impression of the surface of things. A photograph is like a plaster cast in this way. And here's an anthotype of stone carved into cloth. It reminds me of how rock is sculpted by water over time. And as the season is changing now into fall, 
the light is waning and my exposure times go from a week to a couple weeks and even in the depths of winter sometimes nothing even happens when i put it out it's just so dim so working with these natural materials and processes forces me to deal with a lot of unknowns and alan watts has a good way of describing our relationship to the unknown he writes quote the more one studies attempted solutions to problems in politics and economics in art philosophy and religion the more one has the impression of extremely gifted people wearing out their ingenuity at the impossible and futile task of trying to get the water of life into neat and permanent packages end quote so i think to myself we're always trying to control fix define things because it gives us a sense of security but that sort of security is as impossible as tying up water with paper and string photographs are like that package of water they show us how difficult it is to capture life alan watts's message about embracing insecurity seems especially pertinent now in these uncertain times thank you Thank you so much, Christine. There was so much rich, wonderful material there. And I, I was, there was a, the pairing of the rocks about five slides, I think, before your presentation finished there. I was just thinking about how them mirroring each other, that one is looking, it's like looking at itself or looking at its own existence or its own mortality mm -hmm. and how that seemed to relate so beautifully to that story you told about what it would be like for someone to have one of your images in their home and be looking at it. But then in looking at that, they're also not, they're not recognizing their own aging process as well, whilst recounting then what was in the image itself. So there's this mirroring that happens mm. there too. I wanted to ask you, I, I loved what you said about, um, you know, risk taking and the subtle violence of photographs. And it made me think about what is it that attracts you most about myths and about photographically reinventing them? Well, I would say, um, I think that myths are, ways that we make sense of things that are not um, material or mechanistic and they help us understand the underlying meaning and i'm also interested in the way that things are magical or fantastic and don't have to uh, follow a logic in order to feel true and so um, I think that also a lot of the myths, like for instance, in Ovid's Metamorphoses, something happens where like, for instance, someone turns into a tree or someone turns into stone. And I think that those sort of transformations are also something that happens when something is photographed. Right or when we look at something in a photograph, the subjectivity and transformation of the subject becomes more evident. And thinking about evidence and transformation, I, I was also thinking about that risk-taking element and the rate of failure that must, I'm assuming, exist as part of your process. And with the change in season and you describing the length of time, how does one experiment with that as a process because it's quite it's that, that's quite a long time between putting out something for the sun to do its work and then you looking at it two weeks two months later and then realizing it's not doing the thing you want it to do as opposed to the thing it wants to do mm -hmm. how do how do you work with that yeah that's that's a great question i think that it is a very um I find it challenging to, to, it's like a collaboration with what those materials want to do on their own and what I would like to see them do. And oftentimes I'll get colors out of the prints that I don't think work or clash or 
Uh, and I can't, I can't just buy a set of paints and say, oh, I want this color or I want that color. It just, it's like a plant gives a certain color and I can shift it with pH, but there's a lack of control there. But then in terms of the time of experimentation, that has been an ongoing uh, question or strain, honestly, because everything takes so much time and there feels like there's a little bit of a, there's, there's some tightness there in terms of, um, I don't have that quick feedback back and forth. And so things have the danger of becoming precious in that way where I feel like, okay, well, if this is going to take two weeks to expose, I better make sure it's the right thing. But I also feel like living where I am now and being more settled in where I am and having that field there, it's, it's easier to set up a bunch of things at once and see what I get out of them. Right. I love that phrase, the dangers of preciousness. That, yeah. That feels so <laughs> pertinent. So thank you both Whitney and Christine for presenting your work. And now's an opportunity for those of you who are watching or listening, if you have questions and you want to pop them in the chat box for both or either artist, and I can pick them out um, as we go. We've probably got a good 10 minutes at least. Um, so now's the time, please, if you've got questions, let's, let's have them. While we're waiting for folks to ask questions, um, there seems to be some overlap or similarities between your respective practices. And I wonder to what extent you were familiar with each other's work. And as you've been hearing each other talk about your work, if there's things that you've learned from each other um, as, as um, tonight has, has run. I, I'd like to answer that question. Oh. After you. Um, I, was, I was thinking this would probably come up. But so I've, I've uh, admired Whitney's work for a while. I remember seeing it when I was an MFA student at CCA. She had been there earlier to get her uh, undergrad degree. And I think she, I don't know, there were like postcards of her show or something hanging in the <laughs> dark room at CCA or something like that. And then when I moved back to upstate New York, I knew she was at Alfred. So I've had her come in and give lectures in my classes. And so I've had the, uh, the privilege of, you know, the pleasure of hearing her talk about her work. And um, it's interesting because we, we got together this summer and we went swimming. And I, afterwards, I, I was looking at her work online. And the thing that I really admire about it is this um, just letting go. And, um, and I think that that I was thinking about that and like this, this sense of like letting oneself be vulnerable and putting oneself in the picture and letting the, the, the seams hang out rather than making everything all neat and tidy. My work tends to be pretty neat and tidy, but it's also about letting go in its own way. So there, I think we both deal with letting go in different ways. And I think when you look at our work visually at first, you wouldn't necessarily make that connection, but I, I think it's really there. And I, I was also thinking about her work when I was struggling with photographing myself with those hand self portraits with a four by five camera. And it's, it's, I think that the, the struggle of focusing and taking a self, a self portrait with a cable release with a large format camera doesn't necessarily come through in the picture, but it was there. And I thought of Whitney showing that struggle. She makes that struggle much more uh, evident. And I, I, I appreciate that. That's very sweet. <laughs> I, I like, that's very nice to hear. I think um, I'm going to agree with everything you said, sort of, uh, if we, if we have time, can I respond or do we, or should, or should we get to the questions I'm seeing? No, well, we have plenty of questions, but you should respond. If okay. You okay. To. Yeah. Like, I mean, um, our work is so different, but there's a kinship I feel with Christine in just, sort of our patience 
and our work and our work ethic and our sort of obsessive way that we get into a project is something that we've shared when we've talked about like when we went swimming or walking around the campus. And it's just, um, I think, I think what I've always respected and appreciated about Christine's work is the patience and the research and this sort of waiting. Like I can never, I can never do that. <laughs> like, like, but yeah. And the way that it looks when it comes out, this it looks like a successful research, like, like this sort of like an experimentation that I've always appreciated. Also in terms of just looking at them as objects and images. But I do, I do think upon first glance, it's so different, but um, I like that Christine's my cohort in central New York a lot. Yeah. I'll end there. Thank you. So we've had a question between all that from Virginia Hackett. If, oh. if the two of you had had the chance to meet each other, so we know that you have. Yes, Virginia. <laughs> um, a question from Janelle Lynch. Hi, Janelle. Um, for Christine, how and why did you start integrating alternative processes into your practice? Um, I started because of my relationship with my great grandmother and, and grandfather and looking at family photographs and the way that I realized that um, these photographs held stories that were prompts to telling stories. And it felt like so much pressure to remember these stories that, through the photographs and realizing that like, as my great grandmother was looking at these photographs, she was, her memory was, was changing or fading. The story sometimes shifted. I recognized the mutability of these memories and um, wanted to make work about this desire to remember, but the inevitability of forgetting. So I went up to Rochester and learned the wet plate collodion process and albumin printing process from the Ostermans up there and made uh, cabinet cards that were like, uh, that was a, a story dress of stories. So trying to show that storytelling and, and the uh, ambiguity of, of over time as the explicit subject of a photograph. Terrific, thank you. So a question for Whitney from Jenna Westra. Hi Jenna. I'm curious about Whitney's choice to display the contact self-portraits on a mirror. Were you thinking about the viewer's subjectivity there and notions of, and notions of the screen a la Mulvey? Probably because I do think about Laura Mulvey and but at that time like basically it's like taking like 20 years of essays I've been reading about feminism and the body and all of that. But then when I thought about display, I had to think about the space. I had to think about budget, you know, and what came out was like this sort of intense way to share the work, like how, like it was sort of like how intense could I get? <laughs> like how, mm. You know, and I was also thinking about the way that pictures are shared in a more organic, natural setting, like someone taping pictures to their bedroom wall, you know, and the mirror referencing a couple other things too, like a strip club or a bedroom, you know, and so it, it, it's like it was piecing together, Jenna and anyone else, but it was like piecing together these things I've read, movies I've watched, sort of an uncomfortability for the viewer, like the viewer had to look at themselves looking at me in this sort of like anarchy way that a bedroom is, is shaped. Yeah, it was basically like a lot of different things that shape the mirror and the contact pieces and the contact sheets. Great, thank you. So this question is for Christine uh, from Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl, so not, hi Cheryl. Um, Christine, love this new work. How did you come to understand the dying process of, pl the dying process of plants? Oh, well, it started with, I was, I was really obsessed with painting violets and um, 
Then I realized that I could paint violets out of their own juice and that then they would fade as well. And my interest in violets had to do with um, kind of like them wilting when you pick them. And so I thought, oh, well, that's so perfect. And then I came upon a reference to this anthotype process in an old 19th century photography book and um, thought that this was a perfect way of, of acknowledging the impossibility of ever really fixing a photograph. And especially living in Rochester amongst photo conservators at the Eastman Museum and, and RIT, I, I realized that my interest in historic photographs was really about showing the passage of time. Um, and so I thought, well, this process of making things out of fading is so perfect because you can never get around, you can never circumvent the fading. Right, that's a great answer, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've probably got time for one more question. This one's for you, Whitney, um, from Jerry Posniak. Hi, Jerry. Um, Whitney, where your images evolving, where will your next project take you? I ask this after seeing the last <laughs> image of the paper bag. Um, I will be, I, you know, my like honest answer is like, I don't know yet. I'm photographing holes in trees, paper bags. I'll photograph winter more obsessively and um, photograph myself. And then I'll see after that happens what's, what starts forming. I wish I, wish I had uh, a better answer that was more succinct. <laughs> but as I said, it takes me a while to figure out what's going to happen. Yeah. But thank yeah. you for that question. <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. Jeffrey, have we got time for more or are we just about done? Why don't we do what? If you have one more, why don't you do one more? If somebody right. if you have one question that. Um... Okay. Yes, we have a question here. Uh, Christine, I'm curious about how you constructed your boxes for the exposures continuation of boxes question and what role they played as housing for your images? The boxes that I used to expose them. Is mm -hmm. that what, uh, yeah. How did you uh, construct them? Yeah. yeah, that was a long process of trial and error over years and trying to protect them from the elements. Um, at first I copied, or actually my grandfather copied some 19th century contact printing frames and then, but then the, the wall, Water started getting in them and sometimes that makes a nice effect but I wanted to be able to put them outside and not worry about them as much and so I, I constructed those larger ones with um, thick glass and silicone and using pressure from below so I can just put them out in the elements and let them do their thing. Thank you. Whitney, Christine, congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. And I think if anyone's listening who's interested in the program, the applications for next year's Penumbra Workspace program, I believe, are now online. So if you're interested in applying, please do look at the Penumbra website.